Hello, thank you for joining us today. I'm Amy Montoya, an archaeological collection specialist at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture within the Archaeological Research Collections Division at the museum. It is my great pleasure to be your host for this online speaker series titled Innovation in Archaeology, hosted by the Archaeological Repository at the museum. This series brings together scholars who are providing alternate perspectives from which to view the past and present in the American Southwest. Their work is expanding our appreciation of the lives that ancestral people led in this complex and challenging environment, whether by turning a fresh gaze toward museum collections or by offering personal insights into the people behind the ancestral sites as an indigenous archeologist. For the next three weeks, we invite you to join us every Wednesday at 6 p.m. to learn about the exciting work of these, these three scholars. Please check out the museum's Web page under the upcoming events section or at MIAC's Facebook page for additional information about these speakers, the topics, and the links to the Zoom webinars. This is part of an ongoing effort of the museum to stay connected to you during this time of social distancing. This lecture is generously sponsored by the Continuous Pathway Foundation. The foundation supports the cultivation and continuation of culture, education, leadership, community, and individual wellness and economic independence for the Pueblo of Powake and Northern New Mexico region. We are grateful for their support in helping us to provide funds for our speakers, and we ask that you also support their efforts in our community. I would also like to thank and acknowledge Andy Albertson, the museum's former program manager, for helping me to set up this event, and Lisa Mendoza, the museum registrar, for assisting with technical support issues during this webinar. And to die and to Diana Sherman, Art Collections Manager, and Julia Clifton, Curator of Archaeological Research Collections, for providing additional support to make this series possible. Before I start, before I, start I would like to acknowledge and express my gratitude to the Tewa people on which I have the privilege of living on their ancestral land and which Mayak and the Center for New Mexico Archaeology resides on. I ask you today to join me today in acknowledging and learning more about their community and connections to their ancestral homeland known as Okapogi. In the spirit of this series focusing on innovation and new ways of doing things, we at the Archaeological Research Collections are committed to dismantling ongoing legacies of museum colonialism and commit to supporting our local indigenous communities in the areas of repatriation, cultural preservation and revitalization, and supporting indigenous archaeologists and scholars. Lastly, a couple of logistical items before we start. The presentation is scheduled for one hour with a 45 minute presentation followed by a 15 minute Q&A section. During the presentation, all audience members will be on listen and view mode only, meaning all members' cameras and microphones will be disabled during the presentation. During the presentation, audience members can submit questions they would like to be answered during the Q&A section or you can wait until the Q&A section starts and electronically raise your hand. And at that point, I'll unmute you so you can ask your question to the presenter. I'll leave the chat room open in case anyone needs to reach us for technical issues via a private message. Lastly, we are only allowed 100 attendees. So if at any point you decide to leave the webinar and join later in the presentation, please note if we go over the 100 limit, you will be denied access back into the webinar. Also, we will be recording today's presentation and it will be available on Mayak's YouTube channel in the following days in case anyone needs to leave the presentation early or if someone has a bad internet connection. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Louis Garcia. The title of his presentation is called Of Warp and Weft, Fiber Arts in the Pueblo Southwest, Past, Present and Future. Louis of Tiwa Piro Pueblo descent is a traditional Pueblo fiber artist. Over the, over the years, Louis has exhibited his work in various local museums and has talked extensively on the topic of Pueblo weaving at different venues. He is part of the Cedar Mesa Perishable Project, a team of archeologists and Pueblo weavers demonstrating prehistoric perishable collections in various museums and institutions across the United States. Their aim is to compile a database accessible to all who may be interested in learning more about the material culture of the ancient Pueblo Southwest. We had the pleasure of getting to know Louis last summer when he held a workshop on weaving at the center. We are so excited to have him here presenting today. So welcome, Louis. 
Louie. And now I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to share a little bit about my about the work that I've been involved with in the last over the last several years, um, and really um, kind of tell a story of, of my life, a significant part of my life. Um, let me queue up. As um, was mentioned, um, I am a Pueblo fiber artist. I grew up here in Albuquerque. And um, even though I was not um, born and raised on a reservation, you know, I still, um, my family still maintained our connections uh, with, with our family um, down in the Las Cruces area and the El Paso areas. And so part of maintaining the connection with our language, culture, and, ide and Pueblo identity was in my family was through um, the weaving, through Pueblo Fiber Arts. So I will queue up my... presentation here, if you give me just a second. Thank you all for joining us, by the way. Um, it's um, really a, an amazing lineup over these next couple of weeks of some great scholars that have been doing some great work, and I'm very honored to be a part of the, these presentations. So um, today's topic is going to be Pueblo weaving, and um, I'm just going to share a little bit of um, background and kind of give it a context um, so that people kind of have an idea of um, the importance of um, textiles in Pueblo culture and how, give an idea of how far back that goes and what the, um, the significance, how that has maintained over the millennia within um, Pueblo culture and, and society. First, um, what's important, I think, to um, understand is that Pueblo culture has a set of core values. Um, the, main, the main ones being um, life in terms of valuing life and corn as being that staff of life. Um, the value of hard work, prayer and ceremony, song and dance, being humble, um, meditation, and focus on community. So it's all of these um, values in, in unison that come together to create the fabric of uh, what is important within Pueblo culture in terms of um, the attributes that we, that we value in Pueblo life. So prehistoric weaving um, definitely goes back um, several millennia. So we're looking at um, pre-1400s, um, um, the use of various materials such as um, yucca fibers, um, rabbit fur, dog fur, turkey feathers, human hair, cotton, uh, various resist dye techniques, dot in a square motifs, and um, some of the earlier stuff was uh, asymmetrical. Um, so we'll see images of that um, throughout the presentation. This particular image is from Pottery Mound, which is a, a prehistoric village just um, west of Albuquerque. And um, we're gonna see some beautiful examples of textiles and I'll talk a little bit more about how we know uh, what we know about um, prehistoric textiles um, throughout the presentation as well. So pre-contact techniques or um, weaving techniques that existed prior to um, European contact consists of various braiding techniques, also known as spraying, um, either opened or closed circuit um, braiding. Uh, looping techniques, twining, 
weaving, plain weave structures and twill weave structures, tie dye and painting, as well as brocade. Now the latter two um, deal more with decoration of textiles. Um, and we also see some of that in um, the braiding, um, braiding and looping techniques. Um, what's really interesting and what we can tell by um, some of the examples that we see, such as the sandals on this particular slide, that the textiles were one of the ways that people were um, portraying um, various design and, and color patterns that um, were probably uh, regional patterns, just like we see today among the Pueblos, where certain, some of the Pueblos are known for pottery, for example, uh, while other Pueblos are known for turquoise and shell work and other Pueblos are known for drums. Um, so similar to how, it, how things are today, we may have seen uh, similar patterns um, prehistorically that um, people were uh, becoming very skilled and specialized in the techniques, um, most likely based on the materials that they had um, easy access to and then um, just developed from there. So we do have um, two techniques um, that were introduced post-contact, which are pretty common in um, Pueblo textiles today, which are knitting, crochet, and embroidery. Now I put embroidery in the post-contact because embroidery is one of the techniques that we really don't have um, convincing evidence to suggest that embroidery existed um, prior to contact. Um, some of the cases that we do have in the archaeological record were most likely uh, a brocade um, technique which uh, uses a supplementary weft or um, a, a colored um, design yarn that is laid into the weaving to create a pattern. And if we were to remove the, the pattern um, wefts, then we would have a plain weave background. And so these are the, the main techniques um, that make up the, the weaving techniques that uh, existed prior to contact and then um, post-contact. So the first um, example was braiding. And here we, we have an example of a, a, a rain sash or a wedding sash, um, which is still woven out in the Hopi villages and is a braiding technique. If you look closely at the, at the structure um, of the, um, the actual uh, braided part, you see kind of vertical lines as opposed to horizontal lines as you would in a woven um, fabric. In this case, um, we see uh, these vertical lines are created by the rows of braiding as um, they go across the width. Now, one of the main differences between braiding and weaving is that uh, weaving, uh, you have warp and weft. So warp are the vertical elements, uh, the vertical strings of the, the weaving, and the weft are the horizontal elements that go back and forth to um, create the web. In this case, um, in the braiding technique, the elements actually run in an oblique direction or a diagonal direction back and forth across um, from one side to the other of the braid. And what this creates is an actual elastic piece of fabric. And um, that is unique to braiding and spraying. And this particular type of sash is um, the only remaining or the only surviving um, braiding um, technique that is still practiced among the, um, the Pueblos today. And like I said, in this case of the, the braided sash, it's mainly um, being practiced out at, in the Hopi villages. On the, the slide on the right is an example of a spraying shirt. It's actually a replica that 
I spun the cotton yarn for um, back three or four years ago. Uh, myself and a fiber artist by the name of Carol James, who's a fiber artist from Canada, who's actually a Sprang expert, um, decided that she wanted to create a replica of this shirt so that it will be available um, forever um, in within the museum collection. And so um, they, she contacted me herself and another uh, fiber artist um, by the name of Joan Ruane, who is actually um, spinning uh, a master spinner. And she, um, they approached me to get involved with this project. And um, of course, I was happy to participate and we were able to, I was able to spin the yarn for this project, which consisted of 3,000 yards of a single ply cotton um, string that was then doubled to make 1,500 yards of the, the cotton string used to make this shirt. And this shirt was actually done in what's called sprang interlinking. So if you've ever seen a, a chain link fence, that's the basic structure of this fabric in, in the shirt. And it was actually found near the area of Tonto Ruins in uh, central Arizona. And so this piece now, this replica is in the um, Arizona State Museum in um, Tucson. The looping technique is one of the techniques that has since become extinct and uh, it's a technique that did not continue on into um, the present day, at least among, among the Pueblo groups. Um, but it's similar to the knitting techniques that um, are essentially loops that link together. And what is unique about this technique is that it's able to be shaped because you can increase and decrease stitches and that allows it to allows you to create a shaped fabric such as uh, this boot or sock um, that was um, used uh, and made prehistorically. The base uh, of this sock is uh, twine yucca and they would wrap or interspin um, animal fur or turkey feathers to create a more insulating fabric um, that would keep the feet warm. And in this case, we can see a beautiful striped pattern um, that definitely would have required skill to um, spin the cordage and then loop it. Um, but it's a beautiful example of the looping technique. Then we have twining, which is the um, one of the techniques, one of the more specialized techniques used to make the um, the prehistoric sandals, um, also made from yucca. In this case, on the left, we see the upper and the lower um, portions of the sandal. Um, the far left, um, we see a raised tread, kind of like um, traction on the bottom of the sandal. And that's um, done with a very complex uh, wrapping um, technique um, used to create this um, geometric uh, raised tread on the bottom of the sandal. And then on the top of the sandal, you see it, we see that it's more like kind of a plain uh, woven um, textile that would have been uh, used. So this actual pair um, was never used. It was never worn. It was just uh, manufactured and then stashed away until it was found by archaeologists. And I believe this particular pair is in the Edge of the Cedars Museum up in Blanding, Utah. And in contrast, we see to the right another pair of um, beautifully uh, twined uh, sandals with a beautiful geometric patterns of both uh, a natural color of the yucca background with red and black geometric patterns. 
we can, and in this case, we have the, um, the ties, the yucca cordage ties, and then we can look at the, um, at the heel termination. So these, these sandals were actually started at the toe and then twined down and the actual um, warp uh, structures, uh, cordage of the sandals were left uh, free, hanging free. It wasn't uh, a fixed kind of setup such as in, in a loom. So it was um, twined across uh, horizontally with a pair of weft elements um, twisted across in between each uh, weft uh, warp element. So it's very complex and even more complex to try to describe um, to people that may or may not have uh, a background in weaving. But uh, as complex as it looks, as they look, um, they are very complex. In one sandal, you may have anywhere from uh, five to 10 um, different weaving structures going on in uh, one particular pair of sandals. And again, this was very specialized knowledge. Um, they were most likely, this type of sandal was most likely not something that everyone was wearing um, back in, the, in that time. Um, so we see a very uh, unique um, art form that, that went out of um, practice around 1300 is when we see sandals drop off and moccasins, uh, leather moccasins come in. Louis, can I yes. interrupt you real quick? Uh -huh. um, we can't see your presentation. Can we go into presentation mode? You can't or see is, it. Oh, no, no, we can't see it, but um, can we go into the live mode or pl press play? Live mode. Up at the top? Yeah, the button, the play. Uh, share, share. To the left of the screen? To the left. Oh. There you go. Right there. Hold on. There you go. Thank you. So you haven't, you didn't see anything before that? No, we did. We did. It was just, we had all your other little um, thumbnails on the side. Oh, okay. But we were, yeah, this is sorry. Perfect. about Thank that. You. No problem. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. So the, um, so here, uh, the plain weave was a very easy, is, is continues to be a very important um, structure um, used in uh, creating uh, Pueblo textiles today. Um, nowadays, we see uh, more commonly used the commercial monk's cloth, which is a balanced weave cloth that's created commercially that most of the embroiderers, at least out this way in New Mexico, um, being woven, not woven, uh, embroidered. Um, but prior to that, of course, um, the uh, Pueblo weavers were weaving a plain weave cloth. And what I mean by plain weave is that you have a balance um, warp and weft, whereas you, you, you see both warp and weft um, in a balanced um, kind of pattern uh, that creates a grid. And in most cases, um, the warp elements are more finely spun um, so that they're stronger because they, they require more spin because the warp is usually under a certain amount of tension and they're being uh, manipulated by the heddles to create the sheds to create the weaving. So um, the warp elements need to be spun a little tighter um, than the weft, which is the weft is always more uh, uh, lofty, kind of uh, soft um, yarn and usually a little thicker than the warp to to weave back and forth and create the pattern. And what this creates is a kind of like a grid that is perfect for embroidering. And that's what we see in the cases up on the screen of the kilt and the, um, the manta. So these um, textiles are woven on an upright loom, which means that the loom is actually vertical or stands upright. 
and is suspended by two loom bars, um, the first of which is um, anchored to the floor. And then the top loom bar is uh, lashed to ceiling beams or vigas within uh, a home or um, a kiva, which is a ceremonial chamber um, to create the tensioning to be able to do the weaving. Then we have the twill weaves, which is a variation on the um, the plain weaves. In th in this case, um, it requires the use of two or more heddles to create various patterns. And uh, the image on the left, although it appears seemingly appears to be a very simple um, kind of um, more subtle. Um, color pattern where you have the black borders, the red and black borders and the white um, central area. Um, what this particular textile, it has maybe four to five different structures going on in the same textile. And it's hard to see if it's not a close up image, but it's definitely an example, a beautiful example of the uh, various twill weaves. On the bottom right, we see um, a close-up image of <clears throat> the diamond twill in the Hopi mantas, mantas that were uh, woven most likely during the historic um, Pueblo period uh, where they were weaving um, indigo, usually indigo borders, so you would have blue, indigo blue diamonds on the top and bottom borders of the mantas. And this was something that a technique that was lost for a period of time, but has recently um, been <coughs> revived out in the out in Hopi um, <coughs> through various efforts of uh, myself working closely with um, some of the weavers out in the in the Hopi villages. So this is uh, just to kind of give you an idea. Um, the far left image would be an example of a plain weave. So you can see where we have a balance of warp, the black elements, and weft. So you see it's kind of like a checker pattern. Whereas in a 3-1 twill, we would have um, over one, under three, over one, under three kind of pattern as you go across. And that would be offset. So this particular pattern would require four heddles. And then we have a 2-2 two -two balance twill where you have under two, over two kind of patterning that again would create this diagonal um, kind of row. Um, so again, the and there's many, many more variations of these, but they're are maybe three, three or four that were most commonly used in um, the Pueblo textiles, but these are the main ones um, that we see in most of the textiles. In the case of um, the decoration of the textiles, there were many different ways that were used to decorate a plain woven textile, for example, either a manta or a kilt or a cape. And although we don't have a lot of um, fragments or textiles that survived the test of time from, pre from the prehistoric period due to, because it is perishable material, we do have um, murals, um, prehistoric murals that depicted uh, ceremonial clothing and um, textiles of the time. So the uh, Pottery Mound is one of the one of the villages that had um, beautifully preserved uh, murals that depicted uh, many of these textiles, and so many of these images um, come from Pottery Mound. And the one on the left is an example of uh, a tie dye resist manta, where you have a white manta that's been um, 
uh, resist dyed with either uh, some sort of uh, resist um, paste or uh, some kind of tie dye technique um, that was used to create the patterns. And on the right, we have a beautiful example of the uh, textiles that would have been as they would have been displayed in uh, a home or kiva to create a space, a special space, a sacred space um, for ceremony. So just like today, uh, if you know uh, anyone visits, you know the Pueblo homes, like on a feast day or ceremonies, usually, you know they'll have um, textiles up hanging. Uh, from ceiling beams or in some way in the home um, because they're valuable, because they're beautiful, and because they create a, a special place um, within the home or within a ceremonial setting. So in this case, we have um, textiles that were painted on walls as frescoes to um, depict. And so we can see um, discern from these images that the, uh, the different techniques that may have been used to decorate the textiles. And we see that definitely resist dye techniques were definitely um, being used to decorate textiles. So again, we see the asymmetry. We see the square, the dot in the square motifs and these beautiful large white circles that decorate the textiles. And then we see other textiles that have beautiful um, polychromatic designs um, <clears throat> that span the width. But we can definitely discern a certain aesthetic um, that comes from textiles of this period uh, in terms of color palette and design layout. So um, we see some of that carry over into today uh, into the textiles that we see being used today uh, in the Pueblos and others, other um, patterns that did not um, continue. So let me go to the next slide. So brocade is the other technique and this is where I was talking about where we have a set of um, supplementary wefts that um, are woven into the fabric. And so in this case, if we were to remove all of the, um, the colored yarns from this textile, we would have essentially a plain woven fabric. So the colored uh, yarns have no structural value to the textile. It's purely decorational. And in this case, it's, um, the structure is uh, warp wrapping where the colored yarn is actually wrapped around pairs of warps that span the width of the fabric. And this creates um, the well-known um, brocaded sashes that we see used in many of the pueblos today. So the prehistoric weaving, I'm talking about pre-1400. We have um, some beautiful examples in my work with the uh, Perishables project. Um, we look at these collections that were excavated uh, right about the turn of the century um, by archaeologists that are found in various textiles in various places in, in the Southwest, particularly most of the stuff we're looking at is coming from the Four Corners area, southeastern Utah, and um, Chaco, places like Chaco, um, Mesa Verde, and those areas. So to the left, we have an ex a beautiful example of a loom anchor. And this is uh, how we know that the looms were suspended inside of structures, usually kivas. Um, because th this mass could have been anything from dry, from uh, green saplings of like oak bushes 
or in this case, we probably have like a sumac branch that is very pliable when it's green that would have been wrapped on itself with one loop longer that comes up longer and then wrapped with some uh, cordage. In this case, we have turkey feather cordage that was wrapped around this bundle to keep it as a mass. And then this portion would have been buried underneath the ground with this loop left above ground. And there would be maybe three or four of these loom anchors that would be buried in the grounds with these loops sticking out. And then that's what the bottom loom bar of the loom would be anchored to well, the top loom bar would be lashed to the ceiling beams to create the tension on the loom. And archaeologists, when archaeologists find these, it's an indicator that um, weaving was being most likely being practiced in that um, area. We see examples of uh, beautiful basketry done in styles and techniques that are no longer practiced today. Um, but in this case, this um, basket was found full of corn. And so we, we were admiring when we were looking at this in the, in the museum, um, the technique that they used. So out in, in the Hopi villages, they make a similar kind of um, basket known as a tatsaya or a sifter basket um, that actually has a rigid rim that the ends of the yucca are bound to. In this case, there is no rigid rim. It's uh, a cordage that um, holds the ends or the butts of the yucca. And then underneath, we have another twining um, to bind that area there. The bones are um, perishable um, subjects, even though they're not uh, fiber related, but they are, they were used most likely to scrape or, or prepare yucca, uh, yucca fiber for uh, spinning into cordage or making rope and other uses. And um, this image here is some um, cotton string, hand spun cotton string wrapped in a corn husk. And so this really, really uh, intrigued me because it shows how much time and care somebody took to spin up this beautiful yarn and then wrap it in a corn husk to keep it clean. Um, it's definitely an indicator that this yarn was, was uh, being, uh, put away for a special use later on. So again, uh, we see we can learn a lot from studying the Kiva murals and looking at um, the various techniques and patterns. Again, both of these images come from Pottery Mound. Um, but we see some, some decoration techniques that are no longer practiced. Um, and then others that have continued, such as painting um, in the textiles. So Pueblo cotton, um, a lot of people have the misconception that cotton was, is a native crop to the American Southwest. And it was actually introduced between uh, 700 to 900 AD, um, give or take 100 or so years. Uh, it, was an it was introduced from Mexico, from Mesoamerica, and the Spanish document this um, quite a bit in terms of how um, cotton was being cultivated definitely in Mexico and as they made their way up into the um, Pueblo uh, territory, they definitely made note of the um, cotton fields that they uh, found as they made their way north into the Pueblo country. So definitely out in the Hopi villages, there was uh, large amounts of cotton cultivation. And we see various uh, loom and non-loom techniques that were being used um, for cotton. Um, and then backstrap looms, upright looms, extensive, extensive trade of cotton materials, um, both unprocessed and processed materials, 
as well as um, finished textiles that were being traded um, from the south. And then uh, as after the Spanish arrived, they were definitely um, exploiting um, that resource in terms of um, the expertise of the weavers and um, trading of those textiles uh, from the south to the north, et cetera. So the cotton fiber preparation, which we still see in Mesoamerica was the same um, that we know existed here in the Pueblo Southwest because of um, various instruments that, we've, that we do know exist in the archeological record. Um, where the, this is where the cotton is laid on a mat and then beat with a, a series of sticks. Um, or wands, and this serves to open the fibers to um, make it easier to spin. In this particular case, this image is a woman, uh, uh, she's a Nahua woman or Aztec um, from the state of Puebla. She's from the village of Quetzalan, and I actually met her uh, a couple years ago when we visited the village. She's um, still weaving and still spinning yarn and she's an amazing um, textile artist. But we do know that this particular technique exists um, in uh, the Americas and we it is still practiced in Mesoamerica. It died out up here in the Pueblo Southwest, um, but there are some of us that are making efforts to uh, revive it. So Pueblos are first and foremost farmers. And because of the importance of farming in Pueblo life, we do know that um, agriculture is not always foolproof. Um, it took definitely a shift and it was part of our instructions uh, when we came into this, into this world. Um, we knew that it was gonna be a difficult life um, that was going to have conflict and that there would be a, a transformation through hard work and dedication and prayer, we would be blessed with long life and a happy life. So we know that uh, as part of our, our Pueblo values that we continue to, we, we must maintain our agricultural practices to maintain our identity as um, Pueblo people today. So flowers are uh, definitely a metaphor for this um, particular uh, way of looking at life and uh, valuing things that are that are temporary in this in this life. Um, so in Pueblo art, there are always um, cultural symbols that are used as metaphors. And we have many um, backdrops that have many layers of meaning. Everything from color to design and the composition of how these colors and designs come together that, that portray meaning. In this case, we have um, flowers, butterflies and dragonflies, birds, seeds and fertility. All of these um, symbols are portrayed in various art forms from painting to pottery uh, forms as well as um, textiles. So in this case, we have a painting of Michael Caboti where he definitely depicted flowers, um, large mounds of um, cornmeal flour in pottery, pottery, um, jars and the rain clouds, the lightning, all of the rain, all these different uh, water animals, insects um, that come during certain times of the year when we, when we have moisture. So corn again and the other plants, the wild plants that our people um, use to survive for from medicinal purposes to um, culinary purposes, um, ceremonial uses, all have uh, very important roles and continue to play important roles in Pueblo life today. 
In this case, we have flowers that are depicted in many of the textiles. Um, we see the likeness of flowers in all the beautiful colors and patterns that flowers exist. And in this case of the cotton itself, we see that everything um, comes from the seed and goes through its life cycle to create a flower. So we have the actual flower of the cotton that creates the, the bowl where the uh, fiber um, matures. And then as that creates, we have another cycle of flowering where the actual cotton fiber um, expands. So again, in this case, we have uh, various uh, materials that are used, um, including yucca, turkey feathers, rabbit fur, dog fur, cotton, Indian hemp, or opossum. And then post-contact, we have the introduction of sheep's wool by the Spanish. So cotton has a very important uh, meaning uh, and it's, it's related to the clouds, which bring moisture and also um, connect us with our ancestors. Um, cotton itself has a very, very long history of um, human use that goes back probably more than 5,000 years um, from back to the beginnings of um, cultivation. Um, the actual word cotton comes from Arabic, Kutun. Um, it grows in natural colors, not just white, and is also used, cotton uh, is used to make actual our U.S. currency, cotton and linen. So it's actually 75% cotton, our U.S. bills, and 25% linen. So it has many uh, commercial uses, such as filament and light bulbs, cholesterol, free cotton, soy, cotton seed oil, and is hypoallergenic and absorbent. So it has a lot of qualities that we as humans, you know, can make use of. And our ancestors, our Pueblo ancestors definitely um, took advantage of that. So cotton itself is part of the mallow family and it's a cellulose fiber or a plant fiber that is actually a seed fiber. So the cotton itself actually comes out of the seed or grows around the seed to protect the seed. And it's, uh, the, the Pueblo cotton is a very short staple, which means that the, the cotton fiber itself is very short, anywhere from one centimeter to about a half an inch in length. And um, we see that each cotton fiber down here on the bottom is actually one cell that is elongated and it's kind of like a flat inner tube um, that twists back on itself in both directions. And that quality in the twist is what allows cotton to be spun. Then we have the introduction of wool around 1540 um, by the Spanish. And wool was adopted by the Pueblo weavers uh, with time because it did not, wool is a material and sheep were not given to the Pueblo's people, to the Pueblo by the Spanish freely. Um, there were lots of things that were going on during that time in the history. And it wasn't until the Pueblo revolt of 1680 that um, Pueblo um, people actually gained access to sheep and wool, um, which at from that point forward, then definitely they had access to that to weave um, mantas and uh, whatnot. So there's actual a, a breed of sheep that was introduced, which is known as the churro. And it's a protein fiber uh, in contrast to the cellulose or plant fibers. And wool has lots of qualities, just like cotton has its own qualities. Each fiber that fiber artists work with has certain qualities and wool definitely has lots of qualities where, you know, it's it stays warm even if it's wet. Um, it takes dye more readily than cellulose fibers. Um, but although it has lots of qualities, it never replaced cotton. Cotton still maintained that um, cultural significance and ceremonial significance to Pueblo culture. So it still continues to be used, but 
uh, in many cases, the wool was often used to embellish the cotton um, textiles, such as the kilts and the embroidered mantas, and uh, also used to make the um, various sashes and uh, wearing blankets, such as we see uh, from the historic Pueblo weaving period, 1540, from around 1540, the um, Hopi word posala is, uh, comes from the Spanish word frazada, which referred to um, this type of blanket that would have been a plain weft-based weave. Um, Pueblo weavers did not, were not weaving rugs. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of misconception. People, many people think, when they think of weaving in the Southwest, they automatically, almost automatically think of Navajo rugs. And so many people will often ask me, oh, you're a Pueblo weaver. Well, what kind of rugs do you make? And so I have to explain that Pueblo weavers were actually um, not weaving rugs. They were weaving um, clothing. And these blankets were known as wearing blankets. And the, they're very unique because the striped patterns were um, worn uh, sideways. So the stripes would actually be vertical and they would be wrapped around the body. So there were no coats during the winter. So these were the, the Pueblo coats, the winter coats um, when it was cold. Um, but they also became a, a, a status symbol. And so very important um, people within the villages had, would be able to wear these. And so now we see that continue today in the Pueblos where various uh, individuals with leadership positions will usually um, have um, some sort of blanket either wrapped around them or over their shoulder to signify that they have a certain uh, role within the community. Um, in the case of the canel cuasa or the, the manta, uh, the dress is the, the woolen dress of, of most Pueblo women now. And the tirojoya or the, the bird blanket, um, which was woven for little boys, would have been woven from, um, from wool, sheep's wool. In this image, we have a um, Hopi man working on an upright loom outside, working on the, the manta. So we can see um, because it's a dark colored uh, yarn, you need the sunlight to be able to see um, the fine weaving because it's not just a plain weave, it's a, it's, a, it's a twill weave, which is a little bit more advanced. So the more light you have to weave one of those, the better. So the classic period of Pueblo textiles, uh, we see from, let me go back, 1848 to about 1880. And we, we see these uh, kinds of textiles that were being woven mostly of cotton and wool. Uh, we don't really have acrylic yarn on the scene yet, but we do have um, commercial Germantown yarn, which was commercially milled uh, wool yarn um, being produced in Germantown, Pennsylvania that was then traded out this way. And it was the Anglo um, ladies that wanted knitting yarn um, that were bringing this out. And so that was adopted by many of the Pueblo weavers to use for embroidery thread, for the embroidery of kilts and woven in, into uh, the various textiles. So the Hopi, um, uh, the Hopikwewa or the, the sashes, uh, which are black, green, and red, with the distinctive uh, complementary floated warp with the designs on both sides. Again, the Hopi uh, boy's blanket, or often known as the bachelor's blanket. And then all of the um, Hopi wedding garments, which consist of the, the ova, or the wedding robe, and the Wukokwewa, uh, which was the the wedding sash, the braided sash that we were talking about earlier. So from 1880 to about 1920, we definitely have more influx of uh, commercial cloth and materials, which we see reflected in the everyday dress of um, 
the um, the people where we start seeing commercial um, shawls and calico uh, cloth being used for shirts and we start seeing more tailored um, garments such as the shirts these gentlemen are wearing as opposed to uh, woven um, shirts and um, mantas and those kind of things. Then we have the revival contemporary from 1920 on where we have artists like myself who are um, getting inspired by the ancient um, Pueblo uh, textiles and then applying some of those techniques and reviving some of those techniques that have died out. Um, so we see various innovations and the revival of certain uh, techniques and patterns that are long forgotten that we often have to go into museum collections um, to study. So we see these two parallels of um, textiles and Mesoamerican traditions because again we have cotton that came up from uh, Mesoamerica from the indigenous groups of Mexico and not only was uh, weaving was one of the technologies that definitely made up and made its way up into the Pueblo Southwest and that is also um, collaborated with um, the within the uh, Pueblo oral history that we talk about uh, various migrations of people across the landscape and um, people were bringing knowledge um, from different areas. And so here in the Southwest, we see the uh, seashells and uh, various feathers from tropical birds and um, different items that were being traded back and forth. So if these items were being traded, these material items, we can also assume that uh, knowledge and techniques uh, were also being traded back and forth. So there was actually a trade system that was known as a postecayot, uh, which were the Mesoamerican traders that were bringing goods um, back and forth. Um, this was before any borders existed and um, the people were traveling on foot and carrying burden baskets full of um, trade items that would have been traded back and forth. And so we see uh, examples of live parrots and macaws that were being um, brought up from the south and traded into the southwest. So we have this uh, very complex system of trade. So we also have iconography and use of uh, imagery that was coming up. So these are two examples of um, codex images from Mesoamerica that have imagery that would def that definitely resonates with um, with our Pueblo um, ideologies in terms of the planting stick, for example, and the importance of corn um, water symbols. In this case, we have the image of Tlaloc, which is the energy of rain. We have the dot in the square motifs throughout uh, various areas which are connected with uh, seeds and reptiles and I'll show examples of that here in a bit. So in this case we have um, the actual serpent connected with the corn symbol and the planting. So we have all of this iconography that plays an important part of um, Mesoamerican um, tradition. And here's where we see the importance of reptiles in uh, Mesoamerican culture and how that plays into, in this case, we have um, Sipatli, which is a kind of an earth monster or crocodile. Um, again, we see the square, the dot in the square motif, which would be the scales of this reptile, which metaphorically represents the earth because the corn is planted in um, this reptile which represents um, the earth and we see these uh, symbols of serpents on these female deities um, that are related directly related to the earth and so we have female images depicted with spindle whorls in their clothing and the importance the important role of women 
in uh, Mesoamerican fiber arts, which is a little in contrast to the Pueblo culture where it's primarily the men who are weaving. So we see that the girls are we learn to weave from a very young age. They start, you know, learning the techniques of spinning and the uh, uh, intricacies of uh, actual weaving on a backstrap loom. So in this case here we have a Maya woman working on a on a backstrap loom, and then here we have images of Pueblo backstrap weaving uh, from the historic period. Again, the upright looms from about 1100 to 1300. Uh, the upright looms allowed the textiles to be woven wider than long. So in contrast to a rug per se, um, the garment textiles that were woven for garment use usually needed to be wider than long so that they could be folded in half and wrapped around the body. So that's the advantage that the stationary upright looms um, gave to the Pueblo weavers. And this is not something that we commonly see in Mesoamerica today. So we can say that this advancement on the loom was uh, uniquely Pueblo. These are some schematics of the upright loom for weaving of mantas and then the, the sash weaving, all both um, upright looms. These are some of the tools used. Uh, the, besides the, the, the cards, everything else is, I mean, we could be looking at these. Um, they could be a thousand or more years old, um, but we see that the tools remain very simple, usually wooden or bone implements. And um, so we can see that that suggests how far back this um, tradition goes. Um, into the into history. So here we have a gentleman working on a brocade sash. Various weaving techniques. This is a, a wearing blanket being woven. And so we see Pueblo weaving today as a continuity of maintaining identity. It's necessary within the Pueblos, within Pueblo culture. Um, textiles play a very important role in ceremony, um, in uh, portraying meanings, a metaphor, and being present for rites of passage such as birth, coming of age, marriage, and death. Textiles play a role in all of these milestones in an individual's life and usually need to be um, constantly um, uh, purchased and are woven to for individuals in, during these times. So we see them as our children, just like our own children, um, that grow up, that are born, they grow up, they go out into the world to fulfill their purpose and do what they need to do before it comes our time to, to go back home. So in this case, we have our textiles that are woven and go out into the world to make our world a more beautiful place, a more flowery place, um, so that life can be beautiful and enjoy, enjoyable for, for all, living, all living things on earth so that we can continue um, our prayers and our way of life the way that we were instructed to from the beginning. So that's the presentation. We can take um, questions now if we have any questions. Thank All you. right. Thank you so much, Louie. That was amazing. OK, so at this time, we'll go ahead and start our Q&A section. OK, and I'll begin with the first question. So we already have four coming in. Okay. All right. So the first one, Mimi asks, how are cotton seeds removed from the harvested co cotton? That's a good question. A lot of people think that the cotton cards or the beading of the cotton um, were used, but there's actually a couple of different, a few different ideas about that because there's two types of cotton. The first is a naked, there's a naked, what's called a naked seed and then a a furry or a fuzzy seed. So prehistorically, the cotton uh, evidence that we found prehistorically, um, the fiber essentially just falls off the seed. So that could have very easily uh, been um, processed using uh, a pair of sticks that would open the fiber and allow the seeds to be picked out easily. 
Now that was um, prehistorically, but my theory is that it was probably most likely picked out by hand. Um, and that's how I do it with the cotton that I grow now on my own is because the, the seeds that we have now are what's now known as uh, Hopi cotton um, is a fuzzy seed. So the, the fiber itself is actually bound very tightly to the seed. So you actually have to almost, uh, but carefully tear off the fiber from the seed to separate it out. So it's actually a long process that the family, the whole family would most likely have been involved in because it is a very time intensive um, process. Um, but from that point, from the time you have the lint or the fiber off of the seed, um, the rest of the process would have been done within the confines of a kiva uh, of spinning and, and weaving of the textiles. And, and that would have been, that's the kiva is a place that uh, is considered uh, like a man's, a man's um, place for, for ceremony. So that was, that part of the process was very private. Okay. Next question by Paula. Which present day tribes are best known for their textile work? Okay, that's another good question. So the, um, again, the, by far, um, the Hopi villages are, have still maintained most of the weaving and textile arts from the weaving of uh, wedding robes, the braiding of sashes, embroidery, um, all the different textiles that are made that, that make up a part of the, the Hopi life um, from birth to coming of age, initiation, marriage, and death. So at each stage of a person's life, text, textiles are a very important part of an individual's life. So they still maintain that. It's still a very strong um, tradition. And one thing that I may have failed to mention in my presentation is the importance and the fact that most of the textiles that are that were used in the pueblos out this way toward in New Mexico were traded from the Hopi villages. So I like to think of Hopi as kind of the Levi Strauss of the Pueblo world. So they were the textile um, producers that were weaving uh, not only for their own uh, families and community, but also creating a, a surplus of textiles that were uh, woven specifically for the trade pur um, purposes out in the Eastern Pueblos. So I think by far um, the Hopi villages are known for their weaving, but we do have pockets of uh, weavers in several of the villages out in New Mexico, but that's particularly um, is related just to the embroidery of commercial monk's cloth or the single-sided uh, belts. Uh, Pueblo belts um, is what we see in most of the weaving out this way in, in New Mexico. So we do have a limited, uh, uh, a limited practice of, of weaving techniques in the Pueblos. So there's very few of us non-Hopis who um, have learned, you know, the techniques through trial and error or you know, exchanging techniques um, for knowledge, like trading knowledge, if you will, um, back and forth for different techniques. Uh, you teach me this technique, I'll teach you the technique that I know, and that's how, you know, we continue uh, keeping, keeping it going. Um, but yeah, I would say that definitely um, the Hopi weavers uh, definitely play an important role in uh, the continuation of uh, the Pueblo textile arts. Okay, next question by Jamie. Uh, Louis, what are, you, what are you especially interested in and working on these days? So 
That's a good question. I, I have lots of interest in terms of what, I, um, what I'm interested in, but now that I have learned um, the techniques that I wanna learn, um, I wanna focus on doing more experimentation. Lately, I've been working on uh, working more with natural dyes and I wanna start experimenting more with resist dye techniques to create, you know, look at creating some of the patterns um, that were, that we see in the Kiva murals because it's, I mean, there hasn't been much research done in terms of the various dyes that were used, although we have a pretty good idea of some of the dyes that were used. We don't really have any hard evidence or no analysis have, has been done yet on um, you know what kind of pigments and dyes were being used and what were the techniques. So one of the questions that I've had on my mind for a long time now is what was the resist that was used to create those resist dye um, patterns? Um, what are the what were the tie dyeing techniques that were used to create those patterns? So those are all um, questions I've I've had on my mind, and lately I've been working a lot with indigo, so I've been uh, really interested in that and kind of exploring um, that aspect a little more. Okay. Thank you, Louis. Okay, next question by Matthew. I appreciate your discussion and connections of weaving hemispherically. Historically, you mentioned primarily women being weavers in Mesoamerica and for Pueblos, this is mostly men. Can you talk more about gender roles in weaving? What was that last part? Talk more about... Can you talk more about gender roles in weaving? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and so one of the one of the things that I've always um, been curious about because my wife is um, Aztec and she comes from a community in the state of Morelos, Mexico. Now what is her first language? So we spend the family and I spend a lot of time in Mexico and and we we visit um, different communities, different weaving communities. Um, to continue our research and study and connections with weavers throughout Mexico. And what I've noticed invariably is that in Mesoamerica, uh, weaving is still very, very strongly a female activity, which is in sharp contrast to the Pueblos, where as prehistorically and historically, and even still at Hopi today, we still see uh, where it's almost exclusively the men who are weaving. There are certain textiles such as like the, the traditional belts, the uh, black, red, and green belts um, that, you know, there are some uh, women who are weaving those. But when it comes to the more um, uh, specialized uh, weaving techniques such as the braided um, sashes or the brocaded sashes, that still very much remains uh, a male activity. Uh, for very specific reasons. Um, but what's different, what we have to remember is that Hopi has a little bit of a different history in terms of the colonial uh, period um, because although uh, the Spanish uh, made a valiant effort to colonize and uh, Christianize Hopi, um, they were not successful at um, you know making a lasting uh, impact out at Hopi, and although that activity definitely disrupted um, Hopi life, um, we do see through the history that um, the other Hopi villages took measures to put an end to that and actually uh, dispersed a village, the village of Awatobi, um, to to ensure that the the Hopi. Um, practices and the Hopi way of life will continue. And there were no significant uh, efforts after that period by the Spanish to colonize Hopi. So, but the, the, the history in, along the Rio Grande Pueblos or out in the Eastern Pueblos is very different. And so um, we, here we have a case where uh, 
slave labor or tribute was being demanded by the Spanish were so many uh, yards of fabric and so many um, cotton socks had to be knitted um, and produced as tribute um, by the pueblos paid to the Spanish for their protection from the, the nomadic tribes um, that were marauding um, the Pueblo villages. Um, so it quickly became uh, associated with uh, a matter of survival where everyone had to get involved in the process of textile production in order to meet these quotas. And because of that, we have this association with textiles and weavings with slave labor, essentially. And so because of that association, we have a sharp decline in uh, the expertise of weaving of certain textiles. And then we have the American period where we have the boarding school era, where we have uh, traditional gender roles imposed in our Pueblo, uh, on our Pueblo children. Whereas all the little boys were, uh, you know, uh, taken to shop class to learn how to work on automobiles and uh, work with wood, while well, all the little girls would go learn how to sew, uh, spin, crochet, and weave. And so we definitely see that legacy today because I would say out in the eastern pueblos in the Rio Grande area, most of the practicing fiber artists are female. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't uh, a handful of male uh, spinners and weavers, but I would say the majority of the active uh, Pueblo fiber artists out in the Eastern Pueblos or New Mexico Pueblos are still pretty much um, mostly women. And it's because of that uh, boarding school era where you know, the, the women, it was the women who were taught, you know, cross stitch and embroidery and those kind of um, arts and crafts. So uh, we, but, you know, through the work that I've been involved with, with uh, revitalizing and reviving um, the Pueblo fiber arts, then, you know, now we're starting to learn more about it. And I'm, you know, teaching classes and, teaching our Pueblo people, you know, more about this tradition and the history. And they are, many of them are very appreciative of that and kind of um, becoming more empowered to be able to uh, pick up this tradition again and continue on um, to make sure that it, it, it continues on well into the future. That's awesome, Louie. So last question um, by Susie. I'm curious if early techniques looping and looping and twining used a needle of some sort or were they simply done by hand? So that's a that's a very thoughtful and insightful question. It could have been um, a, a, some type of bone needle because we definitely see those um, awls particularly being used in the archaeological record. But most likely, the, <clears throat> the yucca yardage was thigh spun by hand, and it was most likely, um, and I'm talking about in the case of uh, looping, was most likely uh, spun as it was being um, created or being um, woven, looped. So in that case, you wouldn't need a needle because you could just simply, you know, wet the end of the, the yarn in your mouth and then put it through the next loop and keep going. Or maybe with the use of an awl, you would put it in the hole to make it a little bigger so that you can put the yarn through. <clears throat> so it wasn't like they were making yards and yards of this um, uh, yucca cordage that they would have to pull it through each time um, they went through. Now that's, that's a little different because in the case of the yucca sandals, we see uh, actual kits of sandals in process where there were, there were several yards of this cordage that was prepared ahead of time that were, was then used um, to create, uh, to make the twining. And so, 
there's cases definitely in the twining um, there were no um, needle implements um, that were used uh, for the production of them um, possibly in the case of, of looping which is a, a technique both of those techniques by the way um, are no longer practiced in in any of the pueblos that i'm aware of um, those are two techniques that have you know died out from the prehistoric um, period again disappearing right around 1300 so they've been gone for a long time so we I, we don't really see but i don't believe that uh, we have significant evidence archaeological evidence to suggest that needles were used um, for these particular techniques because um, to my knowledge there were no, there were none found associated with these um, bundles all right thank you louie that was that was awesome all right looks like we're done looks like we're, we don't have any more questions so i'm just going to go ahead and close so thank you all for joining us today for this presentation. And thank you again, Louis, for being part of this series and the work you are doing to revive bubble weaving and providing more information on how people in the past wove these beautiful textiles. Um, we really look forward to see, seeing and hearing more about your work and how your work will impact future generations. So we wish you the best of luck in that. Um, so the next week's speaker will be Patrick Piruz from Okeawinge discussing classic Tewa Tewa communities in the Velarde area. So please join us then and thank you again and stay safe during this time. Goodbye. I will, thank you.